Hello, everyone, and welcome to a Thursday edition of the Orange or Brown Talk podcast. Dan Lobby with Mary Kate Cabot, Ashley Bastock. We are at the Browns facility right now. Uh, Jim Schwartz held his introductory press conference uh, about four and a half hours ago as we're recording this. So we're going to discuss that a little bit. Mary Kay, let's just start here. I think let's start with the defensive line and Miles Garrett and how this impacts him, because that's really kind of the I guess that's one of the stories out of this. Uh, Miles Garrett coming off a 16 sack year, tied his career high, but Jim Schwartz has had successful defensive lines before. I thought it was interesting. He made a Calvin Johnson comparison, basically saying in Detroit, we knew that everyone is going to plan for Calvin Johnson and we had to figure out a way to work around that. So basically that's what they have to do with Miles Garrett as well. What did you think of what he had to say about the defensive line and, and how he plans to utilize Miles? Well, certainly, Miles Garrett is the superstar of this defense, and I think it's vitally important for uh, Jim Schwartz to come in here and showcase Miles and help him continue to become the Pro Bowl player that he is, the All Pro player uh, that he is. And, uh, you know, he plans to do that. That's a point of emphasis, of course, and that is Jim Schwartz's strength. He's always been known uh, for getting the most out of his defensive linemen. Of course, he plays a 4 3 front. Uh, he has traditionally played the wide nine scheme. Now, the, the NFL has changed some since he's been a defensive coordinator, so we'll have to see if, if he's still going to play this same wide nine scheme that he is known for. But uh, it's one in which Miles will be lining up, you know, wider than he normally has. And, um, you know, we'll just have to see if teams can game plan to try to stop that. I think in order for it to be really effective – they need to add at least one really good premier defensive tackle. And I also think they need to bring in uh, that second edge rusher. Yeah, Ashley, kind of hearing him talk, and, and I, I wrote the story, so I read those quotes really closely. It sure feels like this team might be three or four defensive linemen short right now. And yeah. obviously, look, Alex Wright can develop. Like Some of these young guys can develop, but just on the surface right now on January 18th, this team feels short a few defensive linemen. Yeah, and especially, like, you think about this system. If he does run something similar to what he's run in the past with this wide nine, or I know, like Lance said, it could be a wide five sometimes, depending on how exactly these guys line up. Um, I, I think it's going to expose a lot of stuff and a lot of holes in this roster, potentially. So I do think they need to build, you know, I think, like you said, Alex Wright, Isaiah Thomas, those are some good, I think, developmental guys, but you can't rely on them to be rushing the, pa- rushing the passer and getting after quarterbacks as much as a guy like Miles Garrett is going to. And, and obviously, I think the defensive tackle holes were evident before we knew who the new defensive coordinator was going to be. But now, especially, like, you have to have strong guys at those spots to kind of, if you're freeing up these one-on-one matchups for your pass rushers, those guys have to take on a lot more, I think, than what we saw in a Joe Woods system. Yeah, and Mary Kay, that, that one, those one-on-one matchups, he, he really harped on those, right? Like, he, he kind of said, and we can get into this a little more, too, he said that you don't necessarily win with pass coverage. You win with pass rush because... In pass rush, you can still set up those one-on-one matchups and go win them. That's harder to do with freakish wide receivers, with the rules the way they are in the NFL now. It's such a pass-friendly league and a receiver-friendly league. But up front, you can still set up and win those one-on-one matchups, and that tells me that you've got to have, I mean, outside of Miles, I don't think there's a guy right now in this roster that you look at and say, put that guy one-on-one against an offensive lineman. He's going to win most of the time. No, you don't have that. I mean, you really don't have that. And I think that's one of the reasons why uh, Jadavian Clowney and Miles really complemented each other very, very well. Uh, Because if two and three guys were hanging off of Miles, and a lot of times that was the case, then that really did free things up for Jadavian. And he was able to to at least get the pressure. Maybe not always a sack, but he would get the pressure. uh, And he would be disruptive. And they need more guys that are disruptive. And, you know, I look at this defensive line and I wonder – you know, why weren't they able to get a sack out of Alex Wright? I mean, like, <laughs> why can't you get one sack out of Alex Wright? We heard such great things about him. So uh, we'll see if Jim Schwartz can do that, if he can bring out uh, the best in a young pass rusher like that. Uh, but again, I do think that they need uh, to find a really good number two edge, and they really need to find that disruptive tackle that can rush up the middle 
and um, you know, and also stop the run. But to get that middle pressure, I think will be key, especially if you're trying to string things out as much as you know he has traditionally done. And it will be an adjustment for Miles, um, but you know he should. Be, I mean, most of the guys that have done it in the Jim Schwartz system have excelled in it, and they've ended up with tons of sacks, and that's what you want out of Miles. Uh, and you know he is obviously the defensive line is in the news right now because you know that's the whole beef that Jadavian Clowney had was that he was getting taken off the weaker link and put on the uh, the stronger offensive lineman. So it will be interesting to see how they try to isolate Miles. Do they move him around? Do they move him inside? Do they move him? Uh, you know, put him on either side to try to bring out the best in him and and to make sure. Uh, that he continues to be the all-pro that he is. So I, I looked this up on Pro Football Focus. They keep track of pressures, and I was I was actually surprised. So Miles was ninth in pressures in the NFL with, I think it was like 70-something, um, and, and it's important to remember that he missed a game too. The Browns didn't have anybody else in the top 100. Like, Jadavion was 108, and then when you expanded it out to 200, you did get a couple of the defensive tackles, but it was, pretty, it was Miles and Jadavion as your top two edge rushers. And Alex, this is turning into an anti-Alex Wright podcast here. We like Alex Wright. We're not giving up on Alex Wright, but he's got to do more than 12 pressures and he's got to start coming up with some sacks. One of the tasks Jim Schwartz is going to have to do is develop him. But Ashley, I don't know if they can just rely on developing Alex Wright to be their answer at even the number three spot right now. Yeah, I mean, and I will say like for for as much as he struggled with getting those pressures. Like at least there was some growth for him with the batted passes. Like he is a really long guy and you can see that when he's out there on the field. So I think that's promising, but I also think you're right. Like they do need somebody who, you know, like Jadavian Clowney in theory can get to a quarterback better than, than Alex Wright did. And like you said, it doesn't mean he's not going to be successful in the NFL, but you know, even when I talked to him going into the last week of the season after the Jadavian stuff went down and, we were talking a little bit about his year as a whole, and, and he knows that he has a long way to go with this stuff. And he said rushing the passer is, was totally different, that it was almost like a culture shock for him coming into the NFL from playing at UAB. You know, he didn't go to some big-time school where he was playing against big-time competition all the time. So I think that's understandable, but at the same time, like I definitely think you might need two more edge guys to come in here considering what you're losing in Jadavian. So, Mary Kay, do they have the money, I guess, to sort of build this Jim Schwartz defense to add, let's say, I, I guess you add one defensive tackle, maybe you draft another, and then what, maybe add an edge rusher and then draft another? Is that sort of the path they should look at? Do they have the money to, to be able to add to those, to those spots? You know, I think you have to go out and you have to spend the money. You've got to find the money somewhere. Um, and they might have to do some creative financing to do it. We've talked about John Johnson. I mean, are they going to keep John Johnson here at $13.5 million cap hit? I think what we heard Jim Schwartz say today was they're going to make the defensive line a priority. They're going to overemphasize it, and they're, you know, they're going to set a very high bar for pass rush up front. So that sounds like dollar signs to me. Uh, you know, I've mentioned, you know, Deron Payne. From the, from the commanders. I don't know if he's going to hit the market, but he's somebody that I would be targeting. Um, I'm not sure if um, Yannick Nagakawe is set to become a free agent, but if he hits the market, he's somebody that I would go after. That's the kind of number two edge that you're going to need. So whatever you have to do uh, to create the cap space that you need to sign some free agents like this or to trade for a guy, that's what they're going to have to do because they need an edge, at least one, they need that one edge, and then they need that amazing defensive tackle, and I would put my money there. Yeah, it'll be interesting to sort of see what kind of say Jim Schwartz has on, on that. I'm sure he didn't take this job and, like, not have any say on what they need. You've got to build. Andrew Barry said it at his season-ending presser. We're going to draft and sign guys to fit with the defensive coaching or to fit with the coaching staff. He didn't specify defensive. That's how they approach their roster build. So on the offensive side, what Kevin wants to do on the defensive side, in this case, uh, before they knew that Jim Schwartz was going to be the guy, in this case, what Jim Schwartz wants to do. And he made it very clear. It starts, it starts with the pass rush. He wants to get pressure with four, and when you get pressure with four, 
that changes everything for um, the defense. Okay, let's take a break, and then when we come back, let's kind of throw some other stuff around that we heard today, and, and I want to hear from you too what sort of stood out to you uh, from what Jim Schwartz had to talk about today. And back on the Orange and Brown Talk podcast, Dan Lobby, Mary Kay Cabot, Ashley Bastock, Jim Schwartz introduced today as the Browns' new defensive coordinator. Mary Kay, we talked about the defensive line. What else stood out to you today? Well, what stood out was um, one of the things that I wrote about, and the headline was, we are going to hold our best players the most accountable. And this is very important because uh, what was wrong with this defense in 2022, more so than anything, uh, it was the discipline, the behavior, the, um, you know, the way they interacted with each other. Early on in the season, I think, you know, we all remember when there were missed assignments and blown cover, you know, blown coverages and missed assignments, you know, people were shrugging their shoulders like, hey, you know, where were you on that play, right? Right. And, like, nobody needs to see that anymore. I thought that was very interesting today that he brought that up, that, like, we don't shrug our shoulders at at our teammate on the field like where were you right i'm picturing one of you shrugging your shoulders at me like the the story (laughs) like where was this point like yeah it's no fun that's not what guys want to see they're out there right so and there were other things like that too i sat in that um i sat in the baltimore ravens media interview room when guys were screaming at each other in the locker room no that's not going to happen under Jim Schwartz. That will not happen. I used a couple of examples in the story that I wrote today. Uh, when he was in Philadelphia, there was a young rookie cornerback who, um, who took Jim Schwartz's word to heart when he told them in the locker room at halftime to blame him, blame the coach, to blame <laughs> him for a call that he made. So the player in his postgame preference, press conference blamed Jim Schwartz. Right? He took him to heart. And he did just that. And he found out the next day, oh, no, no, no. That is not what we do here. Now, we didn't hear as much of that this year that we've had in the, heard in the past, right? We didn't hear as much about, hey, there were no halftime adjustments, right? right? Which, by the way, I heard Peyton Manning say something really funny about halftime adjustments the other day. Yeah, that was that they, that they yeah. Don't yeah, exist. they don't yeah, exist. They don't exist. I've, I've, no heard other people, I've heard other people say that. <laughs> he said, you go, go to the bathroom, you, you eat go. an orange, <laughs> and you come back out and you play. Like, yeah. That's it. That's it. You go to the bathroom, you eat a couple oranges. Yeah, yeah. it was so funny. Yeah. So very funny. But the point is that, you know, he instills a culture of we don't shrug our shoulders at each other. We don't call each other out. We don't point any fingers, and we keep things in-house. And I think that's something that they're all going to learn very quickly. That's how Jim Schwartz rolls. And I asked him, are you going to be, you know, come in like a wrecking ball, you know, the way that you did in in Philadelphia, or are you going to, you know, maybe kind of get the lay of the land? And he said, I'm going to be myself. You have to learn to be yourself. If you have a fastball, you use your fastball. And uh, so he's going to be who he is, and and he's going to pull this group together Uh, in a uh, rapid fashion. Yeah, so he says that about holding the best players accountable. And when when a veteran coach sits in front of the media, especially one as under control as Jim Schwartz, a veteran coach sits in front of the media, I always feel like they have some things that they just want to say. There's things that they're just waiting for the right question. to. I mean, it's funny. I said this to Mary Kay after. I wanted to ask him, you know, what – would, what would winning a championship here be like compared to winning one in Philly where they were so starved for a title and it, it, it was a huge celebration? And he actually just answered that question on his own. Like it was clearly something that he, he wanted to say. And so he just said it at the end of the press conference before I had a chance to ask. Ashley, when he talks about the discipline, when he brings up the Malcolm Jenkins story, um, and he says, best player, I'm going to hold the best players accountable. It just feels like that was something he cle- he wanted to make very clear today. Yeah, I mean, not only to us, but probably to the guys on this team and to a guy like Miles Garrett in particular. And I know I think you guys talked about this on the One Ham hey, K-Pod this week, but I feel like when we saw these disciplinary issues, like there weren't real instances of discipline, except for Perry on Winfrey, who, if I'm him, I'm watching these veteran guys <laughs> Like Miles Garrett only have to miss the opening series of a game for some infraction, and Jadavian Clowney refusing to play on first and second down and coming back the next week and only missing the first series, and Grant Delpit 
only missing the first play against the Dolphins. Like, I have a feeling that would not happen with Jim Schwartz as the coordinator. But, like, at that point, it's hard to kind of, I think, instill trust as, like, a coaching staff when you have a rookie and you bench him for the whole game, regardless of what the infraction was. And then you have other guys messing up throughout the year. And the discipline isn't really discipline, you know. But I think that that is kind of setting the culture here that, you know, I wonder, you know, how Jim Schwartz would have handled some of the things that transpired on this team this year and and what the difference would have been. But I really think that's what this group needs. When when you look at their weaknesses from the last two years, I think they kind of need that disciplinarian energy almost. Okay, Ashley, what else stood out from you from this presser? Yeah, so um, there were a couple of things, but let's talk, I guess, about the the staffing of what the rest of these defensive coaches would look like. And Mary Kay reported in her story earlier today that this would be a collaborative process between Kevin Stefanski and Jim Schwartz and that Kevin will get the final say. And Jim Schwartz basically said that today as well. But I did think it was interesting in hearing him talk about this. Like he said he prides himself on being able to coach coaches. And I think that's interesting that he admitted it wasn't always something he was good at throughout his career, but he really prides himself on being able to do that now. Yeah, Mary Kay, and, and here's here's a quick aside. Our texters, right before we hit record here, got a little inside scoop from Mary Kay about Mike Prefer, his job being safe, Jeff Howard, his job potentially being safe. She texted that out to our to our text subscribers um, as well. So, you know, Mary Kay, I, I thought that was interesting too because Jim Schwartz is a guy that's been around. He probably knows a lot of people. He could probably get a staff here tomorrow with, like, a few phone calls. So I, I did think that was an interesting um, an interesting point, that he sort of deflected that to Kevin. Yeah, nothing is definitive yet, but I had been told over the past week that Mike Prefer has been told that his job is safe. Um, I actually did write that in my Sunday uh, sort of insider column, too, and then I texted it to our subscribers again today. But I had also been told recently that Jeff Howard was told that he was safe, and so that was the first time I put that uh, out there to our texters. But... Um, a number of the defensive guys will remain on the staff. And, you know, I do think it's sort of interesting that Jim Schwartz won't have carte blanche to hire his own staff because some guys do. Mm -hmm. You know, some guys, like if you're in demand, then you have an opportunity to build your own staff. And he's not going to have that. And a lot of the guys that are here are going to remain here. And maybe that's one of the reasons why he got the job. Because maybe the other guys had designs on, on really surrounding themselves with uh, some of the other guys that they, uh, you know, wanted to work with. But he made it very clear, this is Kevin's staff. This isn't my staff. Um, and he's been a head coach before. And he has a perspective uh, that a lot of coaches don't have. He knows what it's like to sit in Kevin Stefanski's chair. So he understands that, you know, by and large, this whole operation falls on Kevin Stefanski and it's going to, the buck stops at him. So that is going to be interesting. They will work together. Now, one of the other interesting parts about it is they don't know each other. They don't (laughs) have, right? I mean, they they don't, I mean, they have not worked together. Um, And, you know, this is really kind of a little bit of a shotgun marriage between the two of them. Uh, Andrew Barry knew Jim Schwartz and worked with Jim Schwartz in, um, in Philadelphia in 2019, got to know him there, but Kevin doesn't really know him very well. So, you know, putting their heads together and building the staff and figuring out who they want to, you know, who they want to stay, it, you know, it will be an interesting process. They'll get to know each other throughout the process. Um, but yeah, this is going to be, um, it'll be interesting to see how this all plays out. Yeah. And I, I've got to imagine Kevin's got to let Jim hire a few people that he trusts, right? Like that's such a, he can't just be sitting in a room. Like his first staff meeting can't be with a bunch of guys he's never met. Um, There's got to be somebody he can trust. And obviously, you know, you don't want to create like factions if this thing starts to go south. But um, there's got to be a few people in this building that Jim just knows implicitly, knows their work ethic, knows what they do, knows what they believe, um, just all of that stuff. Uh, there, there's got to be one or two guys that he's allowed to hire. I would imagine that he's just set it and forget it with them, and then he'll worry about the other guys after that. But, but we'll see. It'll be interesting because it might depend on, you know, if Jeff Howard's your defensive backs coach, there's one spot that you can't hire one of those guys to. That's, a, that's an attractive position. If Kevin says we want to keep Chris Kiffin, I mean, that's a really attractive position to hire somebody into. So 
I don't know. I, I don't know how that's going to work out, Ashley. I guess we'll just have to see. Yeah, that's what it seems like. I mean, it's going to take some time to to get some clarity on that. But it is interesting, you know, just given all of his experience that I think coming into it, I wondered, oh, if they hire him, like, is he just going to have that free reign to hire whoever? So um, it was interesting to hear him kind of demure a little bit on that and, and defer to Kevin. Well, not only that, um, you know, you want the guys that you are coaching with to make sure that they speak the same language right. and that they can carry out your defense and your philosophy. And he's got very distinct ways of doing things. As we speak about this wide nine, that's a little bit different. I mean, they didn't run a wide nine here. And so if you do keep Chris Kiffin uh, and your other defensive line coaches and defensive front coaches, they're going to have to figure out how to coach that. Uh, those are all different teaching points and different coaching points. Plus, there will be a different terminology. So guys will be basically learning a new defense, and you know, for the most part. I, you know, I think that they will. I think that you know, this is going to be a little bit of a work in progress. They're not just going to hit the ground running and it's going to look like a well-oiled machine. I mean, he's got to really install and implement his way of doing things. So um, we will find out over the next couple of weeks who's staying, who's going, and how all these pieces and parts will fit together. Okay, I think we hit the key points. Um, if we didn't, We've got stories up on cleveland.com slash browns, so you can check those out. If you need to be a subscriber, you can click the blue banner at the top of the page and get signed up to be a Football Insider subscriber uh, as well to get that newsletter. Ashley, I think you wrote uh, you wrote Thursdays, so if you yeah. aren't already a subscriber, you missed Ashley's newsletter on Thursday. Um, you also can become one of our texters. I mentioned that earlier. And then, of course, just subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Just search for Orange and Brown Talk. You'll find us there. For Mary Kay and Ashley, I'm Dan. Thanks for listening, everybody.